Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 56th Morsley Debate. Um, my name is James McCabe. I'm the uh, director of the Morsley Debates. And it's uh, a <clears throat> great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the Institute of Psychiatry um, and to uh, welcome our uh, excellent panel this evening. And also to welcome those of you who are uh, joining us via YouTube uh, live streaming. And if you need the URL for that, you can find that um, uh, by going to YouTube and searching for Morsley Debates. Uh, you can also, um, via the uh, King's College London website, if you search Morsley Debates, uh, you can go back and look at podcasts of all of our previous debates, um, going right back to the third uh, debate, which we had back in 2001. Unfortunately, the first two weren't recorded, um, so we're actually going to rectify that by repeating uh, the very first debate, um, uh, which was a debate about uh, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, it was a, a very lively debate. I remember it well. I think it was in 2000. Um, and so we're going to um, have a repeat of that debate um, in, uh, sometime in the spring. Uh, the date is not yet, uh, not yet confirmed. Um, we're also very excited about um, our summer debate, um, uh, which we're doing with uh, debating, debating mental health. And I'm just going to ask uh, Laura Tyrrell to come up just for a minute and tell us a little bit about um, the summer debate. Thanks, James. Um, so, as James said, I'm the director of a program called Debating Mental Health. This program came about um, as a result of a number of conversations I have with young people. I work as a participation officer in children and young people's mental health. And they were saying, actually, do you know what? Young people's services are really great at giving us opportunities um, to participate, but actually what we don't have is the skills that we feel we need in order to make the most of these um, opportunities. They wanted skills like organization, prioritization, articulation and confidence. And so we decided that actually debating would be a really great way for them to develop those skills, but also for them to really have their voices heard on matters that matter to them in mental health. So during phase one of the program, we had over 60 young people from eight different boroughs across London who had used mental health services before, and they were tra trained for 12 weeks in debating. At the end of that, they all came together um, at Facebook's UK headquarters, debated with one another, but also told key decision makers what was important to them in mental health. And for us, that was really just the beginning. That was our first conversation. We've now got over 60 young people who are ready and raring to tell decision makers and professionals what's important to them in mental health. And that's why we're really keen and really excited to be teaming up with Mosley Debates for the summer debates. I'll be around at the end if anyone wants to catch me for a chat. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Laura. And that, that debate is, I think it's the 11th of July, the, uh, the date for that, but obviously we'll be advertising that via our, um, our Twitter feed and our Facebook page and our website. Um, so voting today is going to be via the response pads, which look like this, which you've got in front of you if you're here in the uh, Wilson Lecture Theatre. Um, if you're watching at home or if you're in a, any of our overflow rooms, uh, then you can still vote, but you do it via um, a, a website, which you can access from your uh, from any computer or mobile phone. Um, so it's ra.ombea.com, um, and if you go onto that, you'll be asked to uh, you'll be asked for a session ID. You'll see a page like this, and the session ID that you need for tonight's debate is seven eight four four zero zero. So if you put that session uh, ID in, then um, if all goes to plan, you should um, have an opportunity to vote in tonight's debate. Uh, so we also have um, a Facebook page and a Twitter feed, and uh, we'd like to encourage people to, uh, to tweet um, during the debate. Um, I can see Simon Wesley's there in the corner. He usually um, gets the record for the number of tweets per debate. Um, so it's uh, hashtag Maudsley Debates. Um, and uh, you can also... Uh, submit uh, comments or questions for the panel, which we can't guarantee to, uh, to put to the panel, but if we have time, we will do. Um, so a few housekeeping things. Um, if there's a fire alarm, then uh, basically follow the fire exits. Um, please don't take any photographs or any films and put your phones on silent. Um, so we have a, uh, uh, a sort of test question to test these, um, uh, to test the voting system first. 
Um, I have to say we were having a little bit of trouble with it, some technical problems with it earlier on. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that because we probably jinxed it. But um, uh, So we've put a test question in. And actually, this question is something that we actually want to know the answer to because we're, we're reviewing the way that we... Um, uh, that we advertise the debates and the way that, we, uh, that people book to come to them. Uh, we want to try and keep the debates free, which we think is very important, but it's also difficult. If we just have a, um, first, a, a sort of free-for-all, then we, we can sometimes end up with over 1,000 people turning up. So we've had this Eventbrite system, which, um, which seems to be working reasonably well. So the first question is... Um, if, uh, have you come here uh, by booking a ticket through Eventbrite? If you have, then press 1, either on your response pads or online on the OnBeer website. Uh, or press 2 if you, uh, if you turned up here this afternoon um, and just got a ticket on the door. And press 3 if you're watching us via YouTube. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so you can vote now. Okay, so I think I'll close the vote there. Okay, so that's actually quite interesting to us because um, 161 say that they voted, they booked in via Eventbrite. I'm not sure whether to believe all of you actually, but um, uh, so 161 booked via Eventbrite. 25 have come, have turned up on the door, and uh, and and been, and I think everyone who's turned up tonight has been able to get in, um, and and we've got three people, hi, <laughs> watching on YouTube. Um, Okay, so um, so now comes the uh, the main debate. So we, when we when we first started planning the debate, it was actually in uh, in May of this year uh, when Theresa May had put uh, uh, in her manifesto that the uh, mental health act was going to be scrapped, and so we uh, we we kind of paraphrased her manifesto statement and turned it into a debate motion. Um, so. Um, so the general public had its own view about uh, Theresa May's um, uh, manifesto, and they they all voted on that. Um, so let's see what um, people here think about this motion. So this House believes that fundamental reform of the Mental Health Act is required to reduce discrimination and unnecessary detention. So if you could vote now, please. And so you can vote one for four, two for against, or three for abstain. There's no shame in abstention because you haven't heard the arguments from our speakers yet, so. Okay. So. We have 124 people uh, voting for the motion, 41 against, and 63 abstentions. So, with that, I will. Oh yes, um, uh, we also had a, uh, a Twitter a Twitter vote, um, which actually gave a, a, a very similar result. Um, a Twitter poll, which gave 74% uh, of people said yes on Twitter, and 26% voted no. Um, so I think the nodes have got a, um, got a mountain to climb here. Um, so it just remains to uh, introduce our, um, our chair. So that's Professor Tony David. Uh, Professor David is a, a veteran of the Morsey debates. He's participated in several of them. Uh, he's our professor of neuropsychiatry, and he's also uh, the vice dean for psychiatry in, uh, in the Institute of Psychiatry. And we particularly selected him because of his... Um, uh, his sternness and viciousness, and his um, uh, his, his stickler for timekeeping in particular. So, over to you, Tony. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm using up valuable seconds already. Uh, no, just to, to echo the welcome and thank you to the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience, with its full title. Uh, I'm a professor here and a practicing clinician. Uh, it's great to see such a, a full house. I realize that I'm tearing you away from discussing the minutiae of the budget.
budget or, or the Champions League football, but I'm sure this is going to be full of drills and spills. Uh, although I hope, while a robust debate, it will be respectful uh, and constructive. So let, let me just uh, introduce uh, the speakers. So to oppose the motion, uh, we've got uh, Professor George Schmuckler, who's a uh, professor of psychiatry and society. Uh, he was a distinguished uh, uh, academic in this institution. In fact, he was the dean at some point, and also he was the medical director of the Maudsley Hospital uh, just next door. George has uh, had a very long interest in ethics and psychiatry, and has recently written a book. I'm sure he's going to mention it. Um, on, on this sort of topics, um, uh, but we are very interested to hear what, what he has to say. Uh, on his team is Norman Lamb, who you will recognize. He's a Lib Dem MP, has been for 16 or 17 years. I'll switch on my mic. <laughs> so, hello again. <laughs> um, Norman Lamb uh, is a Lib Dem MP uh, for the Lib and is a spokesman on many issues, has spoken particularly on dementia and mental health. Uh, his seat is North Norwich, I believe. Norfolk. North, North <laughs> Norfolk, like Alan Partridge. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but Norman Lamb does exist. He's a, he, he's a, lo a lawyer by training, I believe. Um, so, that, so George Smuckler and Norman Lamb are going to be proposing the motion. Opposing the motion, we have on my right Professor Scott Weish, who is a Professor of Mental Health in Sheffield. He also is a, an alumnus of this institution. He did his psychiatry training here, um, and then was in North London at the Royal Free Hospital and was a professor at Warwick University. Uh, I think it's fair to describe him as a social psychiatrist, but also a practicing clinician. So we'll have some very interesting points to, to make based on experience as well as his research. Uh, on his team is Annie Bartlett, who is a forensic psychiatrist uh, who is retired from the NHS but used to work at St. George's Hospital, among other places, has worked in low, medium and high security settings and in Holloway Prison. Uh, her background is in anthropology, I believe, and she currently uh, advises the, the Department of Health. So that's our team. Um, in the, the, the traditional fashion, we have somebody first proposing the motion, which will be George Schmuckler, for strictly six minutes. Uh, you'll get a one minute warning. Uh, and then Scott Weish will reply. Then over to Norman Lamb. And then finally, Annie Bartlett. And then we're going to have about 20 minutes for questions and discussion from, from you all. So I hope you'll be able to uh, pick up inconsistencies and, and points from the speakers, or perhaps raise your own points. But I'll be asking you to keep them very brief to, so that we can get as many people uh, heard as possible. And then there'll be another vote after the, the debate and questions, and we'll see whether people's minds have been changed. So. Without further ado, Professor Schmuckler, if you go up to the podium and uh, propose the motion, this House believes that fundamental reform of the Mental Health Act is required to reduce discrimination and unnecessary detention. Right, thank you. I'm going to start with a case. Mr. Firmview, 55, had a history of angina, but woke one morning at 5 o'clock with persistent severe pain in the chest. His worried wife, against his wishes, called the GP. As Mr. Firmview was refusing to see a doctor, a Health and Treatment Act assessment was organised. Soon, an approved physician and an approved health professional arrived. The police and ambulance stood by outside. After a physical examination, Mr. Firmview was informed that he could be having a heart attack and needed immediate hospital care. He said no. The future of his business, especially with Brexit, depended on a meeting in Shanghai, and he was flying out that afternoon. 
Mr. Firmview fully accepted the diagnosis, the rationale for investigations for treatment, as well as the risk of a serious, even fatal outcome. However, he insisted that the risk to the financial security of his family, all things considered, outweighed the risk to his health. The approved physician then sectioned Mr. Firmview under the Health and Treatment Act as one, he had a medical disorder, and two, it was necessary for his health and safety. And this order allowed him to be detained in hospital for 72 hours. Obviously, this is a fiction. Doctors can't force people, ordinary medical or surgical patients, to have treatment against their will, no matter what the outcome. Unless, unless two conditions are met. One, the person lacks the ability to make a treatment decision. That is, they're unable to understand what they are told about their condition, about treatment. They're unable to use and reason with that information in terms of what's important to them. And secondly, that even if they lack capacity, that the intervention must be in their best interest. That is, it must be coherent with what is important to them. Mr. Firmview clearly had capacity. Now, if Mr. Firmview had a mental disorder, exactly the same responses would probably lead to what I've described happened to Mr. Firmview. Under the Fictitious Treatment Act, a diagnosis and a risk to self or others, that is a disorder plus risk formula, would apply. This is exactly what the Mental Health Act requires. And we see then by comparing the capacity best interests model with the disorder diagnosis and risk model that the autonomy or self-determination of patients with a mental disorder is not accorded the same respect as all other patients. The psychiatric patient's ability to decide for him or herself can be ignored. Nor is there any notion of best interests from the perspective of the patient largely according to what the patient values and believes, rather than what the doctor thinks is best. This mental health formula of disorder and risk has not changed for over 200 years. The recent turn in medicine away from paternalism, doctor knows best, to patient self-determination sadly has passed psychiatry by. The Mental Health Act discriminates further in another way. The protection of others phrase present in the risk criterion means that people with a mental disorder are uniquely liable to be detained solely on the basis of a risk that they are supposed to present to others. The rest of us must have committed an offence or be strongly suspected of having committed an offence to be detained. So the much larger group of people in society who are as risky or more risky than a person with mental disorder cannot be detained solely on the basis of risk. The message from this is that if people with a mental disorder are liable to detention solely on the basis of the risk they pose to others, justice demands that all of us should be equally liable. These two forms of discrimination are deeply rooted in two stereotypes in our society concerning people with mental illness. The first is that they are necessarily not competent to make decisions, to make sound judgments. And secondly, they are intrinsically dangerous. So what can be done to eliminate this discrimination? Firstly, the solution, I think, is to adopt the same schema as applies to all other patients, other than patients with a mental illness, to also apply to people with a mental illness. This would be a generic, single uh, piece of legislation in which mental health law becomes redundant. The same law applies to all people who have a difficulty making a treatment decision. It's applicable across all specialties, all settings. Where a person has a difficulty making a serious treatment decision, as a last resort, involuntary treatment would be reserved for those who lack the ability to make decisions for themselves, and secondly, where the intervention would be in their best interests. Now, the concepts of decision-making capacity and best interests have advanced over the years, and special regard is now given, I think this is important, to the person's deeply held beliefs, values, 
commitments and personal important life goals. And I suggest that these can be translated into the notion of will and preferences which figure so importantly in the new UN Disability Convention and in many other United Nations statements that have followed. The attention to values is extremely important in a pluralistic society. So, in summary, I would say, do I have one minute or no minutes? Okay. <laughs> that the moral case for abandoning the current conventional mental health act is decisive, and I hope it's obvious. And I just note what George Orwell recognised so clearly, and that is, to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. Thank you. Okay, George, thank you very much. Thank you for almost keeping to time. So okay. opposing the motion is uh, Scott White. Okay. Well, there's a lot of merit in what George has to say. And actually, we owe him a debt of gratitude for his scholarship and for his passion in this field and uh, for stimulating this debate. Nobody likes compulsory treatment. As psychiatrists, we're often accused of coercion. We know that compulsory treatment is stigmatizing, disrupts social networks, and undermines therapeutic alliances. If we didn't have to section anyone, our lives would be much easier and more gratifying. But it would also disadvantage those who are most in need of help. And currently, I, I would argue we have three problems that we have to solve. First, large numbers of people are being subject to the Mental Health Act every year, and a disproportionate number uh, of those people who are detained are from amongst our most disadvantaged communities, uh, including many people of black and minority ethnicity. More than 60,000 people were subject to the Mental Health Act last year, and black patients are currently three times more likely than their white counterparts to be detained, and this simply can't go on. So we have a problem. Uh, secondly, at the moment, we're not actually compliant with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. The, the committee responsible for the CRPD has said that the United Kingdom, like all signatories to the convention, uh, should repeal legislation <coughs> authorizing compulsory treatment in health care. So that's a challenge that we have to, to address. And finally, but most worryingly of all, the experiences and outcomes amongst people with mental illness in this country are poor. Timely and effective care is getting harder and harder to access every day. And in fact, I can't remember a worse time uh, in terms of the state of our services in the 30 years that I've been practicing as a psychiatrist. But instead of tackling the last of the problems, because it's that one that we really need to think about, instead the government has commissioned another costly review of the Mental Health Act. When we should be addressing the state of our services, we're about to embark on, a, on an arcane legal debate. Okay. Uh, the law isn't the problem, and changing it isn't the solution. Uh, the fusion legislation that George has talked about, uh, where we have uh, compulsory treatment only allowed when decision-making capacity is impaired, is great in theory, but there are grave dangers were it to be applied in the real world. And in fact, it's actually not compliant with the CRPD. The CRPD says that substituted decision-making, so when a person doesn't have the ability to do so for themselves, having somebody who can do that on their behalf is not actually allowed. Uh, legal minds are going to be challenged to find a way around this if the review process leads us down this capacity pathway. And, and, and if we could square that circle, and I really honestly doubt that we can, uh, there's every likelihood that lives are going to be lost and that people in distress are going to go without help. Currently, George is right, the Mental Health Act allows for compulsory treatment based on evidence of disorder plus risk. But restricting that to those judged, remember judged, to lack capacity would mean vulnerable individuals going without treatment. Judgments about capacity are situation specific, time limited, multiple, multidimensional, and notoriously complicated in the real world. Getting it wrong by assuming or overestimating somebody's capacity to make life changing or life ending decisions uh, runs a tremendous risk. Uh, and that's one that, as clinicians, that we would find extremely difficult. Restricting compulsory treatment would also contravene other human rights, including the right to health, liberty, justice, and life. The most vulnerable people are the ones who would suffer the most. The capacity-based approach also fails to recognize that mental and physical illnesses are different, and treating them as if they were the same is wrong. Mental disorders are intimately connected with perceptions, judgment, identity, all the things that George says are part of capacity, 
but are different from it uh, in a way that physical illnesses really are not. Um, in fact, many service users actually retrospectively um, approve of and are happy with the compulsory treatments they've received once they've recovered. The people that I've spoken to tell me that what they really regret is not being given help earlier to prevent crises. Okay. Uh, this has nothing to do with the law and everything to do with resources. Because our services are so stretched, one of the paradoxes currently of the Mental Health Act is that its application obliges services to provide care. Basically, you have to be sectioned to get into hospital nowadays, and only the illest people can get into psychiatric beds. Many people get help because of the act, because the law demands that they receive help. And, far, and our psychiatric wards are more disturbed than ever at the moment as a result of that. They're far, far from places of sanctuary uh, and, and not necessarily places that people find very easy to be. Uh, the number of people who are detained after agreeing to go into hospital voluntarily is going up every year. These are folks who have agreed to go in but change their mind once they see the state of the unit that they're um, being asked to stay in. Uh, we have record numbers of assaults on staff every year. These are disturbed places, not because of the law, but because of a lack of resources. Between 2010 and 2015, NHS mental health budgets fell by 8%, local authority social care budgets by 13%, and 2,000 mental illness beds were closed. Uh, compulsory admission rates fluctuate with the number of available beds. And actually, when you close beds, you push up the number of patients detained in the next year. And we know that black patients are more likely to be assessed and admitted compulsorily, but when research has looked at what happens in the individual assessments, there's no ethnic bias that can be detected. So it's not the law that's the problem, it's the lack of proper resourcing. Only properly funded services can reduce the rates of compulsion, provide the, people, the help that people actually want, and assure humane outcomes for service users and their families. Abandoning the act at the moment would discriminate against people with mental illness by denying them care, and it would then blame them for making bad decisions and choosing not to receive help. We can't divorce the law from the context in which it operates, and focusing on the act, I would argue, right now, is looking too far downstream. It's a dangerous distraction. Unless services are properly funded, changing the law isn't going to make things better for patients, and it could make them worse. Thank you. Thanks very much. Sorry, just to talk across you there, but you were just on time, which is, which is great. <laughs> okay, so our, our next speaker is uh, Norman Lamb. Over to you. Well, I didn't make a great start to my arrival here at the Maudsley. I managed to wander into the ladies' toilet. Uh, so apologies to the member of the audience who I met there. Uh, I beat a hasty retreat. Uh, and I also feel slightly nervous and, uh, being in the invidious position of being a politician with three psychiatrists. It sounds like the start of a joke, but, uh, uh, but I, I will try to give my perspective. And I, the first point I wanted to make is that I think there's a danger of conflating a really important debate about this motion, and this is what we are debating today, about whether the Act needs fundamental reform, with a debate about resources. They are completely different issues. My vision is for a well-funded uh, service that focuses on prevention, early intervention, and recovery, the sort of things that Scott was talking about, but also is based on human rights, equal treatment, and justice. And actually, tonight, I want you to focus on the issue that we're debating, not the issue of funding. We all believe that this service needs more funding. The second point I wanted to make is that I share George's commitment to his particular vision of no discrimination uh, between those with and without mental ill health, just as Northern Ireland has already legislated for. But you don't have to embrace that full vision in order to support the motion. And I, please forgive me for making this analogy, but it's a bit like Brexit. The referendum was a vote on whether to leave. It wasn't a vote on the destination that we're getting to. So the vote tonight is purely a vote on the case for reform of current mental health laws. In my view, unanswerable. Uh, once we agree that they are not fit for purpose, that they're discriminatory, disempowering, out of date, we can then have an informed debate about the extent of reform that we should then uh, seek to embrace. And I would ask you to consider the following points. Now, the Mental Health Alliance 
65 organisations with a commitment to improving mental health care. They published their agenda for reform in June 2018. They got, uh, 2017, they got 8,000 responses from people, many of whom have experience of the system. Their conclusion is the Mental Health Act is not fit for purpose. We urgently call for a review of the Act so that together we can protect the rights and improve care for some of the most vulnerable people in the health system. It would surely be a bizarre outcome tonight if the message that came from here was at odds with that very powerful coalition of people. Why do they reach this conclusion? Well, as George says, the law has been unchanged since the late 18th century. Just think about that. It allows detention on grounds that are unacceptable in this day and age. It's discriminatory against those with mental ill health. Capacity and best interests, the test for everyone else, are not present. Instead, ill-defined mental disorder and risk. We are all, I suspect, in this room, advocates for genuine parity of esteem, for equality, for equal access to treatment. So how could we possibly justify support for a law which perpetuates discrimination? Enshrined in law, for goodness sake, it would be an, a bizarre position for us to reach. How can we justify perpetuating archaic rules on the nearest relative? wholly inconsistent with personalised care, the person and their priorities at the heart of decision making. The green paper that I published in 2015, specifically on learning disability and autism, said it feels at odds with modern views of fundamental citizens' rights. Remember, we argue the case, George and I, for fundamental reform of this legislation. How can we justify denying advanced decisions to those subject to the Mental Health Act, a denial of control and empowerment which is present in all other parts of the health system. Is it really acceptable that someone convicted of an offence and made subject to a court order under the Mental Health Act receives an indeterminate period of detention, deprivation of liberty for periods far in excess of the maximum sentence served by a non-mentally ill offender convicted of exactly the same offence who may be equally or more dangerous. Then there is the issue of learning disability and autism. I said in 2015, I published a green paper which included uh, several uh, proposals for reform of the Mental Health Act because of the anomalous treatment of people with learning disability and with autism under the Act. Nothing has happened since then to change their situation too often they end up in long-term detention, in my view, a denial of their human rights. Now, the Bamford Review, which led to the reform in Northern Ireland, said having one law for decisions about physical illness and another for mental illness is anomalous, confusing and unjust. Support this motion. Support reform based on human rights, empowerment and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Norman. You can tell he's used to this sort of thing. So the final speaker, uh, Annie Bartlett, while she's getting up there, this is the current BMJ, and it has uh, versions of the two, uh, the, the, the proposal and the opposition from, from George and Scott, if people want to have a look in more detail. But so, so the final uh, opposer, over to you. Thank you. I think the last politician I spoke after went on to become a Brexit minister, so I don't know what will happen to Norman. It's such a slur. <laughs> Best thing you could say. Um, I think my role in this debate is something like that of a pantomime villain. So why is that? Well, as a forensic psychiatrist, I might be expected to be at some level enthusiastic about what has become the wholesale detention of the many, not the few. Equally, I might be expected to be enthusiastic about the expansion of secure hospital beds. I am not. I am dismayed. They are, in some measure, failures of clinical care. I come from a generation of forensic practitioners who were reluctant to use the Mental Health Act. We talked to our patients, worked with them to maintain both their liberty and our sense of being doctors. We didn't see our primary identity as that of agents of social control, nor for that matter did we think that we were lawyers. 
Why did we try so hard to keep people out of hospital? Perhaps because we thought, there but for the grace of God go I. Perhaps because we thought that coercion was intrinsically undesirable. The Dutch forensic psychiatrist who had been in Japanese prisoner of war camps certainly taught us that. Perhaps because it's hard to trust a stranger who turns up on your doorstep with a wagon load of police, gets you out of bed, forces you into a ward that may be frightening and is probably at best actually unpleasant. What we tried to do was probably harder than simply wielding the Mental Health Act like an offensive weapon. We know, we know that patients mind about coercion. We know that they don't understand their rights in the way they should because we haven't explained them well enough. We know patients can be compulsory admitted and still get no treatment. They can appeal against detention with little likelihood of success, even though there are problems with the quality of medical recommendations and no proper care plans. Asking for a second opinion takes too long. You may think that I'm exaggerating, but this information is very easy to find. These things happen often enough for us to pause and reflect. Surely it is not acceptable simply to say that the rising rates of involuntary admission, 60,000 last year, are an inevitable consequence of lower numbers of beds. I will relate to you briefly an experience I had with my friend Jill McGauley. We were being retrained in the use of the Mental Health Act. We listened with increasing discomfort to the course content. Not one word of concern about rising rates of detention or escalating numbers of people on community treatment orders. Orders that do not even seem to do the job for which they were expressly designed. Goffman and Foucault might never have been born. We felt ashamed for our profession. It seemed to have stopped thinking that locking people up for whatever reason is never, never an unqualified good. So you might ask, am I actually on the right side of this debate? <laughs> In fact, I am. I am. Because changing the law is not the same thing as changing the patient experience. We need to change the patient experience to put our existing house in order, not a just attempt to build a new one. Changing the law is exceptionally difficult. In 1999, Jack Straw kicked off what you might have called a debate, but was really an argument about preventative detention. It paved the way for an acrimonious reconsideration of the 1983 Act. Not until the Richardson Review recommendations for a capacity-based act were in fact rejected, not until psychiatry had largely kowtowed to a new discourse on risk and surveillance, did we arrive at the 2007 Act? A lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy for something whose workings we and the CQC have largely failed to audit effectively. I sense today that maybe the college might prefer to collaborate rather than argue with government, to fiddle perhaps whilst mental health services burn. Tonight we have to ask ourselves, would it be any different if we did it again? Will it not be, in fact, a distraction, not only from those fundamental funding issues raised by Scott, but also from improving psychiatric practice? Lastly, I wanted to talk not about coercion, not about control, but about what I understand about equality. We have heard much about fairness and equity, much carefully thought through and very well-intentioned. In women's secure services, we've done a bit of thinking about this too. Prisons were built and run for men, but housed women. Secure hospitals were built and run for men, but housed women. Then we worked out with the women who were detained that gender blind services, where everyone was treated the same, was not, in fact, the same as one that treated men and women equally. 
So the model now is of gender-sensitive care. We don't assume that one size, a man's size, fits all. So why is that relevant? Because it speaks to some of the points made already. The idea that equality under law would be achieved by dealing with mental illness and physical illness in the same way is appealing. It sounds right, but it's not. Mental and physical disorders, their effects on the mind and the brain, are simply not the same. To assert that equality would follow from identical approaches to assessment may be a false dawn. And we should first avoid harm, the harm that may follow from letting the very ill but capacitors go untreated and that very small number of folk who might be dangerous walk the streets. We should consider our capacity, not our patient's capacity, to make things worse than they are already. I urge you to reject the motion before the House. Okay, we've heard uh, four excellent speeches. We've heard that uh, the Mental Health Act is fundamentally discriminatory, but reform is not the answer or the solution, that it's against parity of esteem, that it's archaic, that it's against equality, and it's punishing patients for their lack of capacity, not ours. So I'd like to open it up to the audience. Some brief questions and points. Uh, that I'll put back to the panel. I think that lady there was first, and then that gentleman. Is it hello? Oh. Hello, my name is Cheryl Prax from Speak Out Against Psychiatry. Uh, I just want to talk to Scott. Um, I agree with you, outcomes are poor, and I think you should be ashamed of that. Um, and I do think the law is a problem, as well as everything else. And I think you say lives will be lost, but I think lives are being lost now due to the treatment given to people. You say many service users are happy with treatment received. I haven't met those kind of people. Um, and you say there are a record number of assaults on staff due to lack of resources. Well, how about the assault of the staff on the patients every time they're held down to have an injection in their butt? Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me get a few more responses, and I will ask uh, Scott and others to respond. I think the gentleman there was next. And then the gentleman over there. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm Thursday studying global mental health at King's right now. Uh, the country I belong to, Bangladesh, is still struggling with mental health act to implement. So from that background, if I ask you that by, uh, you know, uh, uh, by assuming or suspecting one decisional capacity, isn't it a violation of the family structure of the society? Are, are we thinking beyond the family? I don't know. So it's so open query to you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that gentleman there at the end, and then this lady here is in the front row. Thank you. Just wanted to point out one issue I'd taken with the um, against argument, where we say that physical health and mental health are not the same, therefore shouldn't be treated the same, because mental health conditions affect people's decision making. But that's not, I understand what Fusion is suggesting. We are saying that lack of capacity should be the threshold for having your wishes, though considered, overridden. And if you compare people with who have capacity versus people who lack capacity in relation to physical treatment versus people who are under the Mental Health Act, whether you would agree that that last group have the less say over their treatment and how you can justify that. Okay, let, let's just take those questions. So, never mind assaults on staff, what about uh, is the sort of coercive treatment that's sometimes required or thought to be required in mental hospitals an assault on patients? Uh, I think the question there was about being, if I can 
broaden it, being sensitive to different cultures and cultural structures and, and respecting families' views. And then there's a, there's a question about whether a capacity-based legislation really has its own difficulties. But Scott, can you start off with that first point? I think we are on the same page here. I think we both recognize that mental health services are not anywhere as good as they could be. And people with a relatively short memory, people who haven't been working in this field for, for, for as long as I have, uh, will know that actually services were an awful lot better uh, not that long ago. The wheels have come off really badly, actually. And we actually, the, I think we can, I have to say, I, mental health services are far better in some places, or were far better in some places than are often uh, you know, recognised uh, when you think about how things were when I began training maybe sort of 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I'm, I have no problem uh, recognizing that the experiences, as my colleague has meant, the experiences of patients, people who are using our services, are awful in many instances, and particularly uh, in inpatient settings. I have, you know, I don't dispute at all what you've said about people feeling coerced, people feeling, uh, you know, restrained, secluded, uh, forcibly injected. But that's a sort of symptom of what's wrong. You know, people, that's, that's the very last thing that happens along a very complicated chain. And the real problem is that the things that are kind of upstream, the things that people would choose under a kind of uh, a system where we believe that, you know, people make choices about the help that they want. You know, those, those, those choices, those services that people want are simply not available. Okay. The other thing that often happens is that by the time these decisions are having to be made in Mental Health Act assessments now, or what would become mental capacity assessments, it's very, very rare to find anybody who actually knows the individual concerned. And making those decisions kind of on the hoof with somebody that's unknown to you, it's extraordinarily difficult. Without resources, we're going to be doing that over and over again. Okay. And just, I think probably George is probably the best place to answer the, about the capacity-based um, legislation, you just introduced different problems. I mean, at the moment, you can't appeal against it. You know, you don't have to have, uh, the, the, there's nobody speaking up for you in the same way in the Mental Health Act. Um, is that really going to solve the problem? Can I just say something about the resources issue? Because a law which discriminates against a group of people, discriminates against their liberty rights, we're talking about a deprivation of liberty, is a law that under all human rights treaties is, must be immediately realised. It's not progressive realisation as we find with some laws like providing uh, some human rights, providing the best available treatment, um, employment, participation in the community. Resources are not an excuse for discriminatory legislation when it goes to the heart of civil and political liberties. I agree resources are terrible, but irrelevant to this kind of human rights issue. Now, I, I find it, this is on, on the question of whether people, a number of people have said that physical and mental health are different. I find this a very disturbing argument. I talked about the stereotype of the person with a mental disorder as somehow not being capable of sound judgment, of real agency, of an ability to be, to express full personhood, to carry full rights. Now, the decision that somebody lacks capacity is, in the view of many people, overridden by the fact that they've got a mental disorder. And so they can be treated involuntarily despite fully having capacity. They meet the test that everybody else meets the capacity test, which is not to do with what symptoms they have. It's their ability, as I said, to understand what it is that they're being told about their, their, their problem, about the treatment, about the consequences of having and not having it, of reasoning with that information in the light of what is important to them and their personal values. That that can be overridden is really speaking to that stereotype. There is no test that, can, that they can pass which will affirm their rights. Okay. There's this ineffable sense that somehow they're just not capable. I, I, I want to give other people a chance, but, but thanks for putting that so strongly. Okay, Norman, Norman Lamb just wanted to come back very briefly.
I, I just answer. wanted to address the point made by the lady in the th third row there. Um, my own oldest sister, uh, Catherine, took her own life two years ago, and that was after a ten-week inpatient stay. Uh, and it, absolutely right, it was not therapeutic in any way, her experience. Did it help her to recover? There was a risk assessment done which said she was not safe to be outside, but it didn't do her much good because she took her own life subsequently. And my great preference is not to have a, a bed-based approach where we just think more beds is the answer, which I feared might be the implication of what Scott was saying, but to invest far more in preventing admissions in the first place. Tim Kendall, the National Clinical Director, talks about his experience in Sheffield where he's repatriated people from out of area, he's reduced the length of stay. Length of stay across the country is massively variable without any apparent clinical justification for it and instead invest the money in the community. Now there's a real risk that commissioners' government then doesn't take the money away and doesn't make the investment, but that's the model I think we should be pursuing. Okay, thank you. The lady in there has been very patient with the mic. Hi, I've got a daughter who's been under the mental health in and out of every institution practically, and um, private sector, as well as NHS. And I don't think much of the care. It's not the right care inside a hospital to get well. We sent her away in desperation for four months. She came back well. I have to say I agree with Norman Lamb. And I think that the Mental Health Act, isn't, it's not fit for purpose. Um, the deprival of liberty, I think that's terrible. And also the law needs to be looked at as, around, um, as far as the nearest relative is concerned. And I think it's totally unreasonable. Okay. <laughs> and they say that you're unreasonable as the nearest relative. But in actual fact, the law needs to be amended. Okay, thank you very much. Hello there. Um, my name is Wendy Micklewright. Um, I belong to the Hearing Voices Network. I hallucinate and hear voices, have done since a child. I have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, but I'm not ill and I don't take any psychiatric drugs. Um, there is a book by James Davis called Cracked, Why Psychiatry Does More Harm Than Good. And there's a lot of work that the National Survivor User Network has done around the medicalization of distress. So every time I hear someone talk about mental illness, I find it very difficult because I personally consider schizophrenia to be a lie. I consider mental illness to be a lie. Okay, thank you very much. There's a young lady behind you and then the gentleman there. Hi, um, I've been, uh, I was an out, I've got complex PTSD, anxiety and depression, and I was an outpatient for three years at a hospital. So that was quite interesting when you said about mental illness and physical being different, because I was in the same place where physically ill people were for three years every week of my life. So I kind of saw the, how that's interlinked. But at the same time, I think it's hard to talk about the Mental Health Act being uh, re-looked at without talking about funding because there is, there is a link between the two because I've only, I've been in the last six years, I've only been out for a year before I've relapsed each time. And the, the latest problem that we had was the fact that there was 96 people on the waiting list to get therapy. And I, that was me being halfway through. And it wasn't until I ended up admitted into a hospital because I, I, I hurt myself that I was able to go back in, but they simply didn't have the funding. I was taken out of my free year therapy because they didn't have the funding anymore and my psychiatrist left, which then led to a relapse as well. So it feels like there has to be, I, I, and you're not, I wasn't told, I didn't know anything about my rights. Is, and, and I'm estranged, I don't have any parents around, so therefore I didn't even have the option of having that support of someone else. So I've only learned along the way. So yeah, it's kind of interesting, because I do think there has to be acknowledgement of both funding and the Mental Health Act, and you can't separate the two. But can I ask you, so you, you, you talked about the problems with resources. Do you, do you also think that that, uh, do you also have a strong view about the Mental Health Act itself? Or, or do you think we should be keeping them we should be keeping those two things separately, or do you think they are? I think, I think, I think they, no, I think you have to look at both of them together, because I think for pa patients like myself, that a lot of the time, that's what, that's what I kept hearing, is that we're sorry we couldn't do that, and then, the, and then trialing things, and then yeah, having to cut short treatment, because there wasn't enough Okay, thank funds. you very much for, for sharing that with, with us. Gentleman here in the third or fourth row, I think, was next. 
Um, we have a lot of people up here too that have questions. Just okay, so. sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a question to Scott and then to go on and make a point from that question. You said towards the beginning of your, your piece that no one likes, no one likes to detain um, a, a very stark uh, epistemological claim. W what are you basing that on? That no one, there is no one who wants, that, wants to detain a person apart from a uh, higher minded clinical need. As a clinician, as somebody who sees lots of patients, I have yet to meet a colleague okay. who thinks that having to detain someone is a good idea, and something that we welcome. Okay. I mean, I mean it lead, and it leads on to, to a point about, about uh, power uh, and, and knowledge within mental health. Because uh, if, if you look, I mean, I, I, can, I can show you people who want there to be detention. I could show you my notes where, from living in support of accommodation where staff have complained because I've been going out when they haven't given permission despite there being no clinical or legal basis for their complaints um, simply because it made their lives easier when the CPN wanted to call it. It was easier for them to be able to, uh, to identify. If you just come to your point. If, okay, indeed. Well it, well, it is a point in itself yes. about that. So when you, have, when you have a risk assessment of a patient, it's, it's based on, it, because it's based on simply the opinion of, of a professional, there is no, you know, there is no right or fair process. Um, a, a patient can be damned um, in a risk assessment without um, any uh, factual uh, basis, simply on, 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 a patient's, on a professional's word. And the professionals can be sainted or, or protected based on a professional's word, i.e. that no one... Um, okay, and so, uh, Annie, you wanted to, to come back on that. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on what you're saying because I think that it's important to recognize just how much more coercive psychiatry has become in the last 10 years. So that it's almost double the number of compulsory admissions. And, and outside of the Act, I think that the consequences of the resources are that the individual patient experience is with staff who are increasingly stressed, less tolerant, more prone to react badly, not to be able to sit and talk and work something out with the person in front of them. I think these things are intimately connected. Okay. But the law allows that. The law doesn't give protections to patients against that. Hence, you need a change to the law, because unless there's a change to the law, that behavior will go on. Okay. Hmm. Let me just not discriminate against people at the back. Unwittingly. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, right at the very back row, the gentleman, and then the lady second in the back of this section. Um, I can, last. Thanks. I can understand how a capacity based legislation would stop discrimination against people with mental illness. But when you listen to the media and the government, they don't talk about that kind of discrimination. It's about race and ethnicity. Do the, do the panel think the capacity based legislation would address those concerns? Actually, would you like to address that point? Because we haven't really got into the, the discrimination in terms of different, different groups or ethnic groups as opposed to discrimination against people with mental health problems per se. Well, the, the, as Scott has pointed out, there is an over-representation of patients from black and ethnic minority um, communities within mental health services and particularly in those more secure services. It's very complex to my mind about how this happens, but one thing that is clear is that by the time a person from an African Caribbean background arrives in a psychiatric hospital, they're more likely to have got there via an accident in the emergency department or via the police or via the criminal justice system. So they're starting off from a point where they arrive from the community where already they've experienced a lot of coercion. Of course, once they get into the hospital, there is more coercion. And one then has this vicious cycle that develops of a distrust of the service and the system, and so a lack of in with willingness to engage with the service following discharge. Now, would a capacity-based non-discriminatory law make a difference? I don't know if it would for sure, but I suspect it would. Because when you have a group of people against whom there is clear discrimination, who are socially marginalised, who are socially excluded, who do not have a voice, and under the current Mental Health Act they don't have a voice, 
if you allow those people, if you improve their standing by having non-discriminatory law, the standing of women's rights, the standing of civil rights, the standing of gay rights, has improved in our society and a major contribution has been changes in, in the law. If you improve the standing of people of these um, discriminated groups, they have a voice that they haven't had before. The capacity assessment requires, as I've said, an engagement with the person's beliefs and values, and that's where the cultural issue becomes very important. I suspect that people will feel more listened to, will engage more uh, full-heartedly in the process of treatment and in the process of long-term treatment. Thank you. Okay, Norman, you want to just come in? Well, I, I also think it's vitally important that alongside uh, reforming this legislation so that we have modern uh, human rights-based legislation, uh, we also have to address, just as the woman over there absolutely rightly said, the underfunding of mental health, the fact that it's not that there's discrimination within the NHS against mental health in terms of the funding of it. But we also have to address the social determinants of ill health, uh, poverty, poor housing, discrimination in society, ethnic discrimination in society. These factors, if they are not addressed, there will still be discrimination in the mental health system. Okay, thank you. The, the, the lady... Um, hi, um, I'm a social worker and I wanted to make a point about um, the conversations about capacity assessments in particular. And there was an indication that the kind of decisions, um, the risks at stake are too significant to be considered under a capacity framework. Um, and I just want to comment as social workers, um, and I currently work in mental health, but I've worked with other groups. Um, we work with people engaging in extremely risky behaviors where we are talking about potentially life or death consequences um, of those decisions. And that is dealt with um, for everyone else under the, under the framework of capacity legislation and best interest making uh, decision making process, which significantly must take into account uh, what, somewhat, what we believe someone's wishes would have been based on prior knowledge of them. Um, and I think in light of some of the things we've heard from, from, from users of, um, of, of services and who have been subject to the Mental Health Act, when their experience is overwhelmingly negative and what they're saying in points where they're in a, recover, a position of recovery, then I think that's really difficult to ignore. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Last point, um, the gentleman just behind you there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Osman, one of the psychiatry trainees here. Um, I just wanted to bring it back to the proposition that was being debated, especially with the proposition side. Could you explain to us which part of the Mental Health Act actually leads to discrimination akin to the old US Constitution, which used to say that a black person was worth three-fifths of a white person? Is there such a part in the Mental Health Act that says if you are a black or ethnic minority, or, you know, in regards to the unnecessary detention, that, that should then be the case. You mentioned things about um, gay rights and gay marriage. Those acts were discriminatory. They said a marriage was between a man and a woman, and now that's been changed. If those, and second part of the question, if those parts don't exist in the Mental Health Act as they exist today, surely the problem isn't the act, it's the implementation of the act. And that's where the focus should then be on how the act is conducted, doctors, psychiatrists, social workers, isn't that then the issue? And isn't it a distraction, as the, as the proposition is saying? I, I, I suspect uh, George will want to clarify that in his final remarks. But I think we've come to that point now. I'm very sorry that not everyone has had a chance to have their say. Thank you for uh, raising some really, really important issues and to bring your personal experiences to this debate. So, I am going to ask George again, just literally two minutes to summarise your arguments or, or rebut any of the counter-arguments. I'll ask the same for the other side, and then we'll take the final vote. So, two minutes. Thank you, George. Uh, okay. Well, we've presented, a, I think, a thoroughly convincing argument that mental health law is discriminatory. 
it supports two stereotypes, and nearly every objection to a capacity type law will revolve around these stereotypes. People with a mental disorder are not really, don't really have full agency. They're different. They've got this inimitable quality where we can't actually believe fully what they say and what they wish. I mean, this is hugely discriminatory, negative, and stigmatizing, and there's no evidence for it. The issue of discrimination and resources is important, but when one is talking about liberty rights, resources are not the issue. One must eliminate that area of civil discrimination. Resources become the issue in the development of what are known as economic, social and cultural rights, progressive realisation. You need to have the resources, you need to show that the state is working towards that. Now, the CRPD, or the Commission on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as Scott rightly pointed out, the, the current Mental Health Act scores naught out of 10 in terms of compliance. The Mental Capacity Act probably scores about five out of 10. The way in which I would modify the Mental Capacity Act in the Fusion Act, I think we'll get it up to eight out of 10. You'll have to read about that in my book. <laughs> the issue about resources, I think Scott makes a very interesting point that sectioning a patient sections the services to provide care for the patient. Very sad state of affairs. I would think we should then reintroduce vacancy laws so that people who are homeless are forced in prison, they receive free accommodation and three meals a day. <laughs> I don't think we're seriously going to do that. Resources are important. We support more resources. But at the same time, the motion is about whether our mental health law needs reform. And the discriminatory element which affects the standing of patients, it goes far beyond the immediate sectioning process. It goes to the status, the standing of people with mental disorders within society. And it, we urge you to vote in favour of the motion. Thank you. Scott's just going to sum up his remarks. I'm, I'm also then just going to inveigle Professor Simon Wesley to make a few comments before the vote. Okay. Obviously, he's, he's chairing the commission uh, to look at the mental health. Obviously, he's not going to tell us uh, what he thinks because he's completely uh, neutral and unbiased, but he might give us a little bit about the process. But first of all, Scott, your two minutes. Thank you. Um, let me be clear, I do like the principles. How can you not like a principle based on equality? Of course that's what we want. Okay, but but I, we cannot, we do not live in the theoretical universe that George and Norman inhabit. I'm a clinician. I'm interested in what happens to people, to their outcomes, their experiences. You know, people can change the law and walk away from it. And I can't. We can't as clinicians because we care about what happens to the people that we are looking after. Uh, and they would like us. Norman would like us to separate context, resources, and the law. Of course they would. Of course that's what politicians will always tell us. Oh. Especially, especially, especially when politicians are the people who control the purse strings. We can't, they might want to. I'm afraid we can't in the real world separate the law from the context in which it operates. So yes, change is inevitable. And of course, it is right that we look at the Mental Health Act. Absolutely, we must look at it, and we must strengthen it, and we must look at the code of practice. But now isn't the right time. The conditions have to be met for changing the Mental Health Act. I would love to have the, the capacity-based law. That would be wonderful as a practitioner. But if we did it at the moment, there are going to be people who are disadvantaged, who are excluded. The moment services have to, have to look for reasons for, for rationing. And saying that somebody has made a choice based on capacity as assessed uh, to not have care is a really good way of, of absolving yourself of responsibility for them. We have responsibility as well as rights and obligations and powers and those, those, those responsibilities are ones that we, uh, you know, we're very concerned to, to discharge. The, the, um, uh, the motion that we're asked to vote on, actually, if you look at, says that there should be fundamental reform. I don't dispute that there is a need for a review and there will be an excellent and thorough review. This is not the right time for fundamental reform. Okay, thank you very much.
Can we get a, a, a microphone to, to Simon? Do you, do you, do you agree I, I, that this is a good time to, to consider? It would be absolutely uh, Thanks, Tony. What a good friend you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, there's, I mean, there's never a right time to do these things, and there'll never be a right result. Um, let's be clear on that. Uh, we can improve things, but if we listen to... I've been listening. By the way, this is of the 50 or so of these debates that I've attended. I've chaired them better than you have, by the way. I'd like to point that out. But um, this is one of the best. It is absolutely one of the best. It's one of the most serious, and I thought uh, had some of the highest quality speeches I've heard and highest quality interventions. But we have to be realistic. This act, this this review, was requested by the prime minister just before she lost her voice. If you remember, and the stage collapsed on her, and uh, all those things happened. So it didn't start off very well, uh, for a start. And and let's be also clear: she announced that this would be an end to stigma and an end to discrimination. Well, it won't. And anyone who thinks that it will isn't living on this planet. Um, and equally, anyone who thinks that simply changing the law is going to end all the problems that have been mentioned, um, Scott, or everybody mentioned, it's serious problems in the way mental health services have worked. And indeed, I share the view that in the last 10 years, they have at the core dealing with the key things that we should be dealing with, have actually declined in many parts of the country. It's true that we do have more people working in mental health, but they're not working in this bit of it. And it's true, I do think it's probably true we have a bit more money, but it's not here in the kind of areas that we've been debating today. So, again, so changing the law isn't, gonna, isn't going to... Uh, adjust those things. But we can do certain things in the short term that will make a difference. Um, I'm quite certain of that, and some of them have been mentioned. Uh, the rules of this game is, is that you know, we, 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 we wait and, and take evidence of this. And there's clearly areas where I'm quite sure that we will and can make a difference. There's clearly areas where we probably won't. There's areas where we might be imaginative in rebalancing the system to be uh, at least more responsive to the needs of um, carers and service users. Uh, but I do think one thing I'm quite certain about is we are in a better position to do this than we were 10 years ago. And people who remember 10 years ago, there's more than that, when the last time we tried this started in 1999 in a very hostile climate, very much determined by uh, a fear of dangerousness, a fear of risk, very much determined by very, very aggressive political steering uh, from the government. And if you don't believe me, go and look at the opening speech that was made by the then minister, Paul Boateng, um, in 1999 at the first meeting of the group. And it's quite chilling. It was quite clear that this was about protecting the public first and foremost. Now, that has definitely moved on. There's no question about that, and we will move forward in that um, in, in terms of a shift that this will be a health-led reform with some input from Justice and Home Office and not the other way around, which is what had happened over, over that period. So I'm quite confident that we're in a better position in terms of understanding about rights, understanding about how we do these things, following on from the five-year forward view, and Norman in the green paper you did, that we're in a better place. But are we going to end all these, all the discrimination, stigma, etc.? No, we're not. And we have to be honest about that. I truly believe we will make things better. And I truly, well, hopefully, we'll be able to also outline how we should be going over the next 10, 15 years. We should also remember, by the way, we're not in a, the bad political situation is. We're in a fucked up parliament, okay? <laughs> totally dominated by Brexit. There is very little legislative time left to do anything else, and that's not our fault, but, you know, it's not a good situation. You said, is this a good time? No, it's an awful time to be contemplating major reform because there isn't the space and there isn't, you know, the 1% of the Prime Minister's brain that isn't dealing with Brexit. It's nice that she's thinking about this, but 99% of the time she isn't. So that's not a good sign, which is why we also want to take a longer-term view when perhaps we have a slightly more stable uh, situation in which we could affect change. So, there you go. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Sure, we, we sincerely wish you all the best in, in your work with the Commission, and I, I hope we've given you much food for thought. Okay, it's time to vote. Uh, Vladimir Putin is monitoring your responses very carefully. 
I'm not sure which way he wants it to go. I guess he just wants confusion. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll hand you back to James, who will talk you through it. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, so the vote is now open again. Uh, this House believes that fundamental re reform of the Mental Health Act is required to reduce discrimination and unnecessary detention. If you could vote now, please. Now, I did write down what the, uh, the before votes were, but somebody's stolen my bit of paper that I wrote it down on. Um, ah, it's George. Thank you. <laughs> OK, George. thank you. Um, so... OK, that is, uh, that is quite a... That is quite a, uh, an impressive result. So the... Uh, before the vote, just to remind you, there were 124 uh, voting for and 41 voting against. I think people pressed the wrong button. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want a recount. <laughs> uh, but, but actually, there were 63 abstentions in the, uh, in the before vote, and I th it looks like most of those abstentions have gone to the against side, uh, along with um, uh, many of the four people. So that is definitely a resounding victory for the against side. So well done. Okay. Well, the people have spoken. Yeah. So that's the before and after uh, view. Um, so just before you go, I'd like to thank um, uh, our, our excellent panel, and I certainly echo uh, Simon's uh, comments that uh, I thought the quality of the, the debate was really outstanding today, um, definitely above average. The chairing, pretty good as well. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, uh, two people who've uh, been instrumental in putting this debate together and contacting the speakers, and that's Matthew Hartley and Lucy Stevenson. And I'd also like to thank uh, Hannah Warren, who's our events manager, who this is the first debate that she's run, and it's all gone uh, very, very well. Uh, and also Alex Dionysi, who does our artwork, and the volunteers who've been um, holding mics and uh, helping people uh, to find their seats, etc. Um, I know these uh, clickers are quite tempting souvenirs to take home with you, but if you could please um, leave them on the tables before you go out. Um, and if, you, if you'd like to join us for wine and food upstairs in the hub, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you, James McCabe.